Hi, ArcfieldWeather.com meteorologist Paul Dorian here on Tuesday morning, October the 17th. It's that time of the year again where I like to take a look at a lot of the factors that I believe will be involved with the upcoming uh, winter season across the nation. We have a lot of the key factors right here that we'll talk about over the next few minutes. Now, keep in mind, I'm going through a lot of the graphics that are right there in the posting on the arcfieldweather.com website. Not all of them, due to time constraints, I'll go through some of these. So please, I encourage you to go back and take a look at the posting uh, for the full uh, view of the graphics here that I believe uh, show what could be important this upcoming we uh, winter season. First of all, first and foremost, I take a look at the sea surface temperature pattern across the globe and try to best determine what kind of sea surface temperature pattern we'll have during the upcoming winter season. We have a big change. We've featured back to back to back La Niñas in the last three winters with colder than normal temperatures in the equatorial part of the Pacific Ocean. That pattern changed drastically earlier this year. and Indeed, it looks like we'll head into the winter season with a moderate to strong El Nino, warmer than normal sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific. <clears throat> it's not only the magnitude that's important of the El Nino, it's the location you may have heard of central base or eastern base El Nino. I think this will be kind of a hybrid type of event with starting off as more of an eastern base El Nino that then translates to more of a central base for the second half of the upcoming winter season. By the way, we start off moderate to strong, but it's liable to weaken during the latter stages of the upcoming winter season. Now, an El Nino winter usually features an activated southern branch of, a jet, of the jet stream. That subtropical branch is uh, enhanced by increased moisture content, leading to more storminess across the southern states, which in turn usually results in more storminess across the eastern seaboard. And that is the reason I believe a blockbuster snowstorm is on the table or two this upcoming winter season in the I-95 corridor region where there really hasn't been one in places like D.C., Philadelphia, New York City since about January of 2016. But again, that's back on the table this winter season. Also like to take a look this time of the year for the prospects of cold air intrusions, those Arctic air outbreaks that can make their way from Canada into the central U.S. Uh, and eastern U.S. or even from Siberia to Canada across the pole into the central and eastern U.S. And that's usually done through uh, multiple types of atmospheric phenomena. One is known as high latitude blocking. Another involves stratospheric warming, which leads to polar vortex disruption. So we'll look at some recent trends in blocking over the upper part of the atmosphere and uh, an oscillation known as a quasi-biennial oscillation that uh, involves the winds in the lower part of the stratosphere over the tropics. That particular phase is certainly suggestive of a colder than normal winter in much of the eastern half of the nation. Uh, also, another signal uh, involves the Siberian snowpack. And finally, we take a look at some analog years in which I believe the sea surface temperature of these analog years will closely resemble what I expect to see during the upcoming uh, winter season. And we kind of take a look back to see what kind of winters those analog years featured to give us a clue as to what to expect during this upcoming winter season. Now, let me say up front here, I believe we'll have a colder than normal winter in the eastern and southern U.S., warmer than normal conditions across the northern plains going to the Pacific North west which will be quite a change for that part of the nation and above normal snowfall for much of the eastern and uh, southern u.s as well now let's scroll down on this posting again every graphic i will show here in this extended video discussion uh, can be reviewed if you go back to the arcfieldweather.com website and take a look at the posting i will not go through all the graphics that i have just due to time constraints this is the sea surface temperature pattern of a year ago, October of 2022. And look at that. Blue represents colder than normal conditions. We had La Nina not only last winter, but three winters in a row, back to back to back La Ninas. And that has changed dramatically. Look at this current 
sea surface temperature anomaly pattern featuring El Nino extending all the way from the west coast of South America all the way out into the central part of the Pacific Ocean. A couple other interesting features, warmer than normal conditions here over the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. And notice a little blob of colder than normal conditions just off the east coast over the western Atlantic. That's as a result of upwelling that took place with the passage of tropical systems a month, two months ago. Uh, that upwelling as a result of the tropical storms moving over those uh, waters of the western Atlantic and causing water, colder water from down below to rise up to the surface still remains some of the effects of those tropical systems a couple of months ago. And uh, that may normalize over the next few weeks where it becomes more uh, closer to normal, uh, but still a signal here of colder than normal waters just off the mid-Atlantic coastline, thanks again in, in uh, large part to those tropical systems a couple of months ago. Well, what kind of uh, jet stream pattern can you expect in an El Nino winter? Here's a nice graphic from NOAA. And in an El Nino winter, the southern branch, the subtropical uh, branch of the jet stream tends to become stronger, maybe push a little bit farther to the south, and it has enhanced moisture content because those warmer waters in the, the tropical Pacific Ocean tend to cause more evaporation, more water vapor enters the atmosphere and helps to aid in the development of storms along the southern U.S. And again, that can end up causing some storms to ride up along the Atlantic seaboard. So I believe there's a better chance of uh, nor'easters this winter season, which uh, can uh, certainly produce a blockbuster snowstorm or two. Places like D.C., Philadelphia, New York City, Boston certainly haven't had any for several years in many parts of the I-95 Carter region. But this activated southern branch of the jet stream will play a big role, I believe, in the upcoming winter season. Well, in terms of the El Nino, this is an interesting loop that shows the temperature anomalies across the Pacific, the tropical Pacific Ocean, over the last several weeks going into the middle part of the month of October here. And you certainly can see the uh, El Nino. And again, I believe it'll be more of an eastern base with higher sea surface temperatures relative to normal just off the west coast of South America over the next couple of months. But then later on in the winter season, uh, that relative to normal difference will be uh, greater in the central part of the Pacific Ocean. And that's important because the central-based El Nino tends to feature a uh, high-level, uh, upper-level ridging across the west coast, and that in turn increases the chance for Arctic air outbreaks to make their way from Canada into the central and eastern U.S., where as a, uh, a strong east-based El Nino can kind of overwhelm the system with mild air across the eastern part of the nation. So again, we'll have kind of a hybrid, I think, starting off uh, east-based with a moderate to strong El Nino, but then shifting to more of a central-based El Nino later on in the winter season with a weakening El Nino. Now, let's continue to move down here. I want to show why I believe El Nino will continue in the upcoming winter season. We saw the current sea surface temperatures featuring El Nino conditions, but multiple computer forecast models show uh, this sort of a pattern. This is NOAA's climate model called the CFS, and it's the sea surface temperature anomaly pattern for December, January, and February. And there it is, El Nino extending from the west coast of South America all the way into the central part, pretty much on an equal a uniform basis across the central and eastern when averaged out over the three months. Again, I believe more of an eastern based early on and then central based later on. This is not the only model that features El Nino. By the way, it continues, interestingly, that colder than normal uh, area off the mid-Atlantic coastline. Another model right here is the uh, from Japan, the uh, Japanese agency, similar with El Nino conditions from the west coast of South America all the way into the central part of the equatorial Pacific Ocean. So uh, certainly pretty good confidence that we'll have uh, uh, an El Nino event going into the winter season and, and lasting through the upcoming winter season. 
Now, what are the chances for cold air intrusions or frequent cold air intrusions into the central and eastern U.S. this winter season? I, uh, one of the things I, I like to take a look at is what's been going on during the past few months. Persistence forecasting, as it's known, is not a bad idea in the sense that a lot of upper air patterns form because of the sea surface temperature pattern around the world. And sea surface temperatures change slowly. So uh, what it has taken place during the summer season can very well continue in the fall and the winter. And we have had a lot of high latitude blocking, which in turn increases the chance for cold air intrusions from Canada into the central and eastern U.S. This is the 500 millibar height anomaly pattern for June, July, August, and September. And look at this pattern here with high latitude blocking shown in orange and yellow, higher than normal heights, 500 millibar height anomalies here. This is a perfect example of high latitude blocking, which generally features higher pressures than normal over Canada, over Greenland. Again, that in turn tends to lead uh, towards uh, cold air intrusions, certainly a better chance of cold air intrusions from Canada into the U.S. This, by the way, is a, a perfect example of what I call an omega blocking pattern because the upper air wind flow repre pre, uh, represents the, uh, the, the omega, the Greek letter omega, the shape of the Greek letter omega right here with lots of highs and lows. We have uh, low pressure, upper level trough, over here and then this upper level ridging over here so again omega blocking certainly has been persistent during the summer season going into the fall i believe that will continue in the upcoming winter season uh, again persistence forecasting sometimes is uh, quite useful and high, la high latitude blocking increases the chance for cold air intrusions from canada into the u.s well, I mentioned that there were multiple atmospheric phenomena that can uh, dictate whether or not cold air masses can make their way from Siberia or Canada into the central and eastern U.S., uh, in addition to high latitude blocking, which features higher pressures than normal over Canada and Greenland, Iceland. Uh, there's a feature known as stratospheric warming that can disrupt the polar vortex. A polar vortex is an upper level low it typically sits near or right over the North Pole during the Northern Hemisphere winter season, but it can be displaced. It can be broken apart. It can uh, be shoved to one part of the pole. And anytime it is disrupted, weakened, or uh, displaced to a different location other than near or over the North Pole, that increases the chance of cold air outbreaks from the northern latitudes into the middle latitudes. One of the oscillations that we follow, known as the quasi-biennial oscillation, really has a strong correlation, uh, depending on its phase, with the likelihood of stratospheric warming or polar vortex disruption. Uh, the quasi-biennial oscillation refers to a flipping of the phase of tropical winds in the lower part of the stratosphere from a westerly to an easterly phase, otherwise known as a positive or a negative phase. And it has been found that in a negative or easterly phase of the QBO, uh, there often is a colder than normal winter in the eastern half of the nation. And again, please refer back to this posting here. I have a lot of detailed information on the whole quasi-biennial oscillation. But in the last few months, it has become uh, more and more negative here. In fact, in the last month of September, the reading was uh, down to a, a pretty strong negative 13.58 in terms of the QBO. And again, a negative or an easterly phase of the QBA is strongly correlated with a colder than normal eastern half of the nation. In fact, if we scroll down here a little bit on the actual posting here on the arcfieldweather.com website, we see this map. This is actually a compilation of winters where the QBL is in that range of negative 10 to negative 15 for the winter season, a strong signal for colder than normal conditions 
across the eastern half of the nation. And in fact, if that increasingly negative pattern continues and we end up negative 15 to negative 20, that's an even stronger sig signal for colder than normal conditions in the eastern half of the nation. Well, and certainly another thing I like to do this time of the year is take a look at analog years in which uh, the sea surface temperature pattern in those past winters resembles what I believe will happen this winter. My main criteria in choosing these analog years, and I came up with six uh, from the last 50 or 60 years or so, uh, had to do with a long-standing La Nina that evolved into an El Nino in that particular winter season. Again, we've had back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back La Ninas. I wasn't necessarily looking for that because that is rather uh, infrequent uh, back to back to back, but I was looking for a long standing La Nina that switched to an El Nino. And I purposely included some Eastern based El Ninos with Central based because, again, I believe this would be kind of a hybrid type of El Nino beginning as Eastern and then ending as Central based. And come up with six different analog years here going back to the 1950s. Again, in those years, I believe the sea surface temperature pattern mimic what I expect to see this upcoming winter season. So it's quite useful to take a look back at those analog years and see what kind of a temperature pattern and precipitation pattern uh, uh, evolved. That gives us a clue as to what to expect this year. And in fact, let's scroll down here. This is the temperature pattern. When you average all those analog years together for the uh, December, January, February time period across the nation, clearly a signal for colder than normal conditions across the so southern U.S., across the eastern U.S., and warmer than normal from the northern plains to the Pacific Northwest. Again, this is what I expect to see happen, colder than normal conditions in the east, in the south. Warmer than normal in the northern plains will be quite a difference from the past few winters where it's been well below normal. Now, what about precipitation pattern in these analog years. Well, sure enough, uh, that southern branch of the jet stream produced some uh, increased precipitation, above normal precipitation from California across much of the southern U.S. and right up along the uh, Atlantic seaboard. Again, keep in mind, we have an activated southern branch of the jet stream in an El Nino winter that uh, is, uh, features enhanced moisture content those uh, warmer than normal sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific cause an increase in evaporation, which increases the water vapor, and higher humidity leads to stronger storms in the southern U.S. that again can make their way right up along the Atlantic seaboard, increasing the chance for a blockbuster snowstorm in the I-95 corridor region this upcoming winter season. So let's wrap up with this, uh, this extended video discussion with the bottom line here. And again, I did not go through all the graphics that are out there on the posting. So again, if you uh, have the interest, please go and refer to the posting right there at artfieldweather.com. First of all, I expect colder than normal conditions across the central and eastern U.S., warmer than normal northern plains in the Pacific Northwest, largely based on a moderate to strong El Nino event during the first part going into the uh, winter season that will in fact weaken during the second stage, the second half of the winter season. It is likely to be an eastern based El Nino initially, but then kind of transfer to a central based El Nino. There is an increased chance, in my opinion, for uh, uh, multiple cold air outbreaks from Canada into the central and eastern U.S. as I believe there will be an increased chance of high latitude blocking. Uh, taking a look at the omega pattern that has persisted for months, I believe there will be an increased chance of stratospheric warming and that polar vortex disruption uh, largely dictated uh, by that quasi-biennial oscillation and uh, that could lead to temperatures averaging some half a degree to a degree and a half in that immediate DC, Philadelphia, New York City corridor for the upcoming winter season and perhaps a blockbuster snowstorm or two in the I-95 corridor region with above normal snowfall likely DC, Philadelphia, New York City as listed right here on the uh, arcfieldweather.com website. So we will continue to monitor all of these factors over the next several weeks, but this is the winter outlook 
for 2023-2024 for arcfieldweather.com. This is meteorologist Paul Dorian.